okay. Uh, let me tell me when to here. go. And then uh, I'll let you know. Uh, we are online. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are we everything are we okay? fine? It is okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Bom dia a todos. Dobre utra to anyone that's watching in Russia. And uh, I have a special guest here today at Umbra University. And uh, Elisaveta, on behalf of Umbra University, all the, the faculty, the, the students, uh, the, the directors, and I welcome he, you here in Umbra University. Umbra is a, a law school, not only law school, it's also a business school, but it's a university uh, in, in the US, in Orlando, in Florida, but we mostly teach in Portuguese, also in English, but mostly in Port Portuguese. Most of all the students are Brazilians. So welcome to, to, to the university. And I will just make a quick introduction of your resume, your short uh, biography here. Uh, Elisaveta Gromova, she's a professor at the Department of Business Law and Deputy Director for the International Cooperation of the Institute of Law in South Europe State University. She is also the coordinator of the LLM program, Law and Digital Technologies. Her field of expertise includes digitization of law, as well as free and special economic zones. And this free and special economic zones is the topic. It's, it's today's topics, right? Like the sandbox and, and, and it's a hot topic here in Brazil because in June of this year, uh, the, 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 the regulatory body of the stock market here in Brazil uh, she, they, they enact uh, a resolution for the sandbox here in Brazil. And of course, the companies to apply for that, they must be innovative, they must be, uh, they must apply new technology and there are a, a bunch of requirements that they must fulfill to uh, make part of this sandbox here in Brazil. So it's a new topic in Brazil and, and, and I know you've been studying that a lot, you've been publishing and studying that in Russia. So your lecture is very welcome to us. So we can make uh, a comparative uh, study on this topic in the near future. So I welcome you here and thanks very much for being here with us today. I know we have uh, our time zones are so much different. You are eight hours ahead from us and thank you. And uh, I just, you know, the, the stage is all yours right now. So feel free. To, to your lecture and whatever you need, I'll be here. Okay, okay, thank you so much. So first of all, everybody again, good morning, bom dia, dobre utra, dobre vecher, good evening, because now, yes, it is evening in Russia. Um, greetings from the South Ural State University. I want to say that uh, this is a very, very big honor for me and for to represent my university, my faculty uh, here today. We are really, really happy. So, uh, Professor Ferreira, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, first of all, uh, let me try to share my screen. Yes, because I prepare, I hope, a very interesting presentation. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Just, mm -hmm. so let's just get whenever on. you can, but we can see it clear. It's clear here. It's all right. Okay. Okay. So uh, as you can see, the topic I would like to speak today is the regulatory sandbox as an unorthodox tool of smart regulation. I do not know if, uh, I hope that uh, the people who are listening to me today, they are familiar with the term regulatory sandboxes, the uh, regulatory sandbox, but if uh, they are not, it is not a surprise, of course, because uh, this tool is, um, Elizabeth, sorry, 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 sorry yes, to interrupt yes, you. Just pressing yes. the presentation button in the PowerPoint so it, 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 it becomes bigger. It, it goes to the whole screen. Down there at the bottom of the... So what the should PPT, I do? I should... It's, it's right there, the mm -hmm. icon on the, on, on the bottom of the... Yeah, you got it. That's it. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, okay. 
No, no, that's okay. Um, yes, as I told you, this, this topic is very new. Uh, it is almost unresearched, but it gives us a very good, very good opportunity. And so the regulatory sandbox is an orthodox tool for smart regulation. And I want, you know, I try to show you today the potential of this tool and hope I can do this. And I'll try to do my best to do it. So I would like to start uh, my lecture, or I do not know what is it, the presentation, uh, with the quotation of the famous philosopher, Francis Bacon. He said it, uh, you know, he wrote it in the collection of essays in 1625. And he said, as the births of living creatures at first are ill-shapen, so are all innovations, which are the births of time. So what does it mean? Uh, emerging of the digital technologies is a real challenge for the people, for the state, for the law, of course. Why? Uh, because uh, when such technologies appear, we really do not know what to do with these technologies, how to regulate these technologies. And, um, but we just cannot say, well, let's not do, let's do nothing with these technologies because they do have a really, really, they do have a big potential. Their opportunities of its usage are almost, are almost infinite. And of course, nowadays, um, the state who owns the digital innovations is the state who can own the world someday. And that is why, of course, it is a very, very, it, as I said, it is a challenge uh, for every state to create a policy uh, which could help to develop digital innovation. So, and if we had, uh, and now I talk about policy, but now let's talk about law. So what are the consequences of the emergence of the digital technologies for law? Of course, what law must do? Law must react somehow. But how? For example, uh, when, firstly, when uh, such, I don't know, when cryptocurrencies appear, like Bitcoins, Ethereum, uh, the first reaction from the state was a confusion, of course, uh, because uh, we really do not know, didn't know what to do with these cryptocurrencies and how to regulate this technology, uh, these cryptocurrencies. And for example, China firstly said, no, there will be no regulation for uh, cryptocurrencies and we will not allow crypto, uh, to use cryptocurrencies within China. And... Um, and the same, the same situation uh, was in Russia. We really didn't know what to do with the cryptocurrencies and other digital technologies. We still do not know uh, that we still don't know what to do with the artificial intelligence. And so, of course, it's a challenge. And the law must react. We understand that law must react. But another question, how should law react? And I want, uh, yes, also I want to say about the consequences of emerging of the digital technologies um, regarding to the example of this robot. Yes, you know this artificial lady. I hope you know her, you are familiar with her. Uh, this is Sophia. Uh, yes, it is, a, it, it is a robot with artificial intelligence. I hope, yes, and it is famous. She's famous all over the world and uh, she was granted with the citizenship of Saudi Arabia in 2017. And this was, and this, uh, uh, under this example, uh, we can see what the, this was the emergence of the digital technology and what are the consequences for law. So this, uh, robotics, yes, this robot with artificial intelligence, and she really do, she really do, she has an artificial intelligence. Uh, she knows how to use gestures. Uh, she knows how to, she knows how to recognize the faces. 
but is she a subject? Uh, so if she was granted by the citizenship of Saudi Arabia, it doesn't mean that now she is a subject of law. So it's a very, very controversial question. And uh, the next question also I want to ask it as the citizenship of Saudi Arabia. Uh, so she does she uh, must she pay some taxes <laughs> if she is a citizen of a uh, citizen uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia. So these are all interesting questions which appears due to the emergence of the digital technologies. So and the next slide I want to demonstrate you and talk and discuss you the consequences. Uh, but it was these consequences are made on more lady, ladies example. So and um, as you know, the Sophia the robot, she had a photo shoot uh, in very, very famous women magazines. And here is another question. She participated in a photo shoot. So who will get the payment for this photo shoot? Sophia the robot or the Hansen, um, or the Hansen company, uh, the producers of the producer of Sophia the robot? This is also a very interesting question and we do not know how to, how to answer this question now. The answer should be we should pay for Sophia because she has the artificial intelligence. Or maybe we should pay for Hansen Robotics, the one who produced her. And of course, it's up to law to find the answers on this question. So as I say, it was a ladies example, but I have another example, this man. So uh, another trend, yes, of course, Sophia is a very big trend, uh, but there is a lot of other trends because digital technologies are spreading very, very fast. So if we're talking about drones, drones are very popular across the world, of course. So now uh, the companies are working to um, produce drones with the artificial intelligence. And these drones could teach itself how to fly. On the first, on the one hand, of course, it is significant that drones now can teach itself how to fly. On the other hand, uh, if there will be a crash uh, caused by the ability of this drone to fly, what will be the consequences? Who will be responsible uh, for the actions of we do not know, and the law doesn't have answers yet on this question. But as I say, we must find these answers because if we will not uh, develop digital innovation, we could not be every country, if every country will not develop the digital technologies, uh, there will be no way to become a leader. And that is a very dangerous for very dangerous for a country who doesn't have the digital technology and doesn't know how to uh, use them properly. That is why, of course, one of the main uh, tasks for each state nowadays is to remove the barriers for the development of the digital technologies. And if you will see uh, the slides, you can see the barriers. So the first one, of course, is the lagging of the law from the rapidly developing social relation. And as I told you, the example with the emergence of cryptocurrencies, uh, this, is, this is a very good example uh, because as I told you, the law still doesn't know what to do with these crypt cryptocurrencies. Um, Another one is the absence of the good legal condition for the rapid emergence and implementation of new products and services. It's also the lack of flexible mechanisms of legal regulation and the creation and implementation of digital innovations. And last but not least, but maybe one of the most important is the lack of legitimate opportunities to establish exemption uh, from some regulatory requirements to remove obstacles to the emergence and implementation of the digital innovation and to determine new rules in return. 
and uh, to remove these barriers, uh, the legislator of each country tries to find the most effective, efficient, and proper and adequate regulation uh, for the digital technologies. And nowadays, there is a, several concepts which influenced on the modern approach uh, to the regulation of the digital technologies. So the first one is the smart regulation. Uh, this approach was used and using now by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. There is the 12 principles of the smart regulation. Uh, but of course, firstly, they started with the concept of less regulation because uh, it was started in, I guess, uh, more than 10, this process was started more than 10 years ago. And uh, now, and, and it was a time of the big um, regulatory reform where it was said that uh, there are a lot of excessive regulation and we should shorten this regulation. For example, if we're talking about Russia, well, I will now make this example, but it, it, it is not about the digital technology, but it is a very good example of the excessive regulation. For example, it is said uh, that the hives, for those who would like to um, get the honey, yes, to produce the honey, um, the hives must be colored in, must be painted in deep in some colors. So this is the regulatory requirement for those who would like to produce honey, and and that is why to um, to get rid of this uh, over regulation. The concept of less regulation was made, but after uh, we understand that less regulation is not good, so there and there was another concept which was called better regulation. Of course, we need not less regulation, but we need a better regulation. But after that, the new concept appeared, and it was called smart regulation. So of course, the regulation must be smart. It shouldn't be less regulation or with better regulation, it must be smart. Another concept is the concept of good governance. It is also, this concept is uh, very popular, especially within the European Union. Uh, this concept is almost about the public service, but it is still up to the digital technologies regulation, because of course we must, uh, the, the governance, uh, yes, the, the governance must be the good is not uh, the term yet, the good. it must be transparent, it must be legitimate. And another concept which affects uh, the new way of regulation, of course, this uh, agile governance. Uh, this, term, this term came to us from the IT, of course, because when we're talking about digital technologies, there is a lot of um, uh, mixed, of law and IT. So agile governance means flexible governance, sensitive governance. So, and uh, now there is a sort of mix of these approaches. And these approaches, uh, this, the, the main approach is called breakthrough regulation. In Russia, we use this term breakthrough. Um, and one of the aspects of this breakthrough smart regulation is the use of experimental regulation as a new approach. And in this case, uh, the regulatory sandbox, of course, is the example and the main tool experimental or the breakthrough regulation. And if you're talking about the origins of this term, so of course, as I said, it is IT. Um, it is a sandbox, is a closed virtual environment designed for safely isolated testing web products or software projects. And yes, they had, we have such a Google, not of course we, but Google has uh, the sandbox, which allows to test uh, the products, the innovative products in a safe environment. There is another point of view that the term regulatory sandbox came uh, from the pharmaceutical sector. 
uh, from the clinical trials which are required to prevent consumer harm while testing new innovational medicine or medical technology. And uh, it was, of course, not legal definitions, but if we're talking about the legal definitions, so we can see these definitions here on this slide. And here is uh, the different definition from the different countries. So, uh, for example, if you're talking about the United States of America, so the, according to the United States Treasury report, uh, the regulatory sandbox is a solution that allows to apply regulatory reliefs under the current legislation to permit important experimenting for the new digital product. Another one, uh, yes, it's from Brazil, as Professor Ferreira said, uh, that uh, in Brazil there, are all, there is also a regulatory sandbox. It is uh, operated by the Bank of Brazil, and it aimed at the development of the, of the financial technologies, innovation financial technologies. So regarding to the regulations of the Brazil, uh, the regulatory sandbox is the initiative that allows institutions to test innovative projects like experimental products or services with the real customers subject to specific regulatory requirements. And last but not least, of course, is the Russian definition of the regulatory sandbox. And as you can see, we do not use a term regulatory sandbox in Russia. Because maybe I think that the legislator think that uh, it must, the term sandbox could confuse <laughs> the Russians because we use sandbox only for our children in the yard. So we use another term. This term is the experimental legal regime. So maybe it is because of the uh, roots of the Soviet Union with this term regime, this is very Soviet Union. And regarding to the Russian understanding of the regulatory sandbox, so the sandbox is the temporary control introduction of the experimental legal regulation for the activities carried out with the use of digital innovation. So as you can see, the Russian definition is quite different. Uh, talking about uh, the origins, yes, the history of the regulatory sandboxes, I want to say that United Kingdom is uh, the first, is the pioneer of uh, using the regulatory sandbox. So they started in 2014, uh, so there was a project in Avate, not was, of course, because this project is working now, but it started in 2014. And this project, Project Innovate, uh, envisaged the model of regulatory sandbox, where fintech companies can test innovative products, services, and business models in a lead market environment while ensuring that appropriate safeguards are in place for temporary authorization. And uh, the first experience of using the digital technology, the regulatory sandbox was very, very successful. As you can see that uh, the, according to the statistics, yes, that the regulatory sandbox helped more than 500 companies to develop their innovation activity. And more than 40 firms receiving regulatory authorization. And according to the uh, last news, these uh, firms, these companies, they are still in the market and they still producing these digital technologies and these uh, experimental products and services. And of course, it was a very, very big success uh, of the United Kingdom regulatory sandbox model. And after this, of course, uh, the regulatory sandboxes started to uh, spread across the world. You can see in the slide, um, 
Yes, here is a map. So we can see how, uh, how widespread are those tools in the world. So uh, just sorry, because it is written that Brazil is the country considering regulatory sandbox. Now, of course, because in Brazil, we have already regulatory sandbox. And uh, also uh, there is a figures. Yes, the figure shows us uh, the increasement of the size or decreasement of the amount of the investment, uh, which was uh, made by the usage of the regulatory sandbox. And this is, of course, this is a very, uh, this, this is great because this tool is a really new, but this tool already shows us how efficient could it be. Of course, if we will use it properly. And now I want to talk about the criteria. So we understand that uh, the regulatory sandbox is a sort of safe environment. And within this environment, innovative service or product could be tested. Tested how? So for example, if we know that there is no regulation or there is the, some regulatory requirements which uh, do, not allow, uh, do not allow us uh, to develop this innovation and we want to develop because we think that this innovation is, has a potential to be developed. Uh, so we should use a regulatory sandbox. But of course, we must say that not all innovative services could be tested within the regulatory sandbox and not all, um, not all entities could participate in uh, the regulatory sandbox. It's not all the entities could be the participants of the experimental regulation. So first of all, what can be tested? Of course, as I told you, it is a digital innovation or service or product based on this digital innovation in the sphere of financial technologies. And if we are talking about financial technology, it is a widespread sphere. So almost all countries, not almost, but all countries uh, which are now implemented uh, the regulatory sandbox they do it firstly to develop financial regulation or to develop financial technology. But at the same time, uh, in other, inside separate countries, for example, in China or in India, uh, the sandboxes are used to develop not only in financial technology sector, but also for insurance, insure tech as it's called, or for capital markets. But uh, I want to say that the legislation of my country is, in this case, of course, is much more progressive, uh, which I like uh, regarding to the regulatory sandbox model, because uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, in Russia, there are a lot of direction of using, a lot of areas of using the regulatory sandboxes. So we can test innovative services or products in the sphere of medicine, education, transportation, construction, agri agriculture, and so on. So there are a lot of opportunities to test digital technologies in Russia. And I think this is how we want to create a comfortable jurisdiction. But also in the world, uh, in the world, there are other types of uh, other directions of the regulatory sandboxes. So, for example, if we're talking about uh, China, they do have a, a regulatory sandbox aimed at developing only one technology. It is a blockchain. So here is the regulatory sandbox. This regulatory sandbox for a blockchain in China who can participate in regulatory sandbox. So as you can see in Russia, it could be business entities. It's universal, yes. If you're talking about some other countries, uh, 
uh, this could be authorized and non-authorized entities. In some countries, it could be only startups. So it depends uh, from country to country. And another uh, fit and proper criteria, of course, is the eligibility criteria for products and services. As I told you, not all products and services could be tested within the regulatory sandbox. So what are the eligibility criteria for this product and services? First one, of course, is the absence of the regulation. This is very important because if they have a regulation, there, is no, there are no reasons for testing the digital service or product. Another one is the necessity to ease the regulation for enabling this innovation. And later uh, we will discuss some real examples and it will become clear that, uh, how to understand, yes, if we need temporarily is the regulation or not. And last but not least, of course, uh, the proposed, uh, we will test the innovation if uh, this innovation shows promise of easing or effective delivery of service in significant way. Uh, in the slide, sorry. In the slide, I want to demonstrate you the stages uh, of the of, of the regulatory sandbox of using usage. So, of course, first of one, first of first of all, we must talk about the application because if uh, the company would like to become the participant of the regulatory sandbox, it must it, this company must apply for it. Then uh, she went, then after company applied for it, uh, the regulator, so it is a, um, this is an authorized body. For example, if we are talking about testing all the financial technology, of course, the regulator who will evaluate the application is the bank. For example, in Russia, if we want to test uh, financial technology within the banking service, this will be the Bank of Russia. And uh, the Bank of Russia will consider our, the application of the company and uh, he will decide if this application, if the product or service is good, if this service has the potential to for the development or not. And then uh, this, uh, the company with the regulator together must develop a sort of a plan, of course. And uh, this shows us uh, that this is a very interesting feature of the regulatory sandbox and how the government's governance uh, becoming really agile, just really flexible because regulator and applicant and the potential participant, not the potential, yes, but the participant of the regulatory sandbox, uh, they make some coordination, they make some cooperation to develop a test plan before the testing starts. And this is a very good. And uh, for those uh, who, in, uh, who make research in the sphere of regulatory sandboxes, they said that regulatory sandboxes show, uh, sandboxes show us that the role of the regulator of the state uh, is changing now. So now it is not the domineering subject, no. Now it is uh, the equal partner. Now it is more, even more just advisor. So uh, talking about the next stage, it is of course one of the most important stage. This is testing. So what is testing? Of course, uh, this is the period, time period within uh, which uh, the service, yes, we, 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 can, we, we started to use the service. Uh, we are using this service in a real market condition because we have a consumers. We have a counterparties 
but uh, it is very important, of course, uh, that the time limit for testing is not very big, uh, especially if we are talking about the uh, legislation on regulatory sandbox in Great Britain, in Singapore, in Australia. So it mostly three to six months. So it is enough to test to understand if the innovational if the innovation service or product is has a potential or not. Uh, if we are talking about the Russia, if we're talking about Russia, so I can say that the testing period is quite different in Russia. So uh, regarding to the federal law on experimental legal regimes, we uh, the company could test the digital innovation during three years. And if you're talking about the testing of the artificial intelligence, later in details so it is five years i can you feel the difference between this three to six months in other countries or up to 12 months if you're talking about india for example <clears throat> or china but if you're talking about russia it is three to five years which uh in my opinion is of course too much uh, because uh, while the testing period lasts, the company is really in greenhouse conditions. And uh, this could lead to a failure when the company faces the real world. And also, this, because the company has some relaxation, uh, this very long period could lead to some abusement, abusement of the rights. So, of course, and of course, in my opinion, yes, it is too long to test the innovation for three or to five years. And uh, the last stage of uh, the of the regulatory sandbox is, of course, the assessment uh, and the assessment of the potential of the digital technology. So, for example, if we're talking about Russia, uh, we do some monitoring of the innovational service. And after this monitoring, we, uh, the regulator, made the decision. So the decision could be to, yes, to say that this, re this innovation has a potential and we must regulate it. We must say that this special regulation, this relaxation, we can use it further. After this innovation leaves the uh, regulatory sandbox, or uh, the regulator will say that there is no need, there is no necessity to, uh, to regulate this innovation. Because, for example, it, uh, if we will regulate and if we will use this innovation, it will lead to the, uh, for example, violation of a human rights. It is possible of the violation of the consumer's rights, which is also possible. And I will talk about it a little bit later. So, and here is in which the uh, regulatory sandbox is this, in which the experimental legal regime ends. Yes, with the decision of should we regulate the innovation or we shouldn't regulate this innovation. Now I want to talk a little bit about Russian experience. And as you can see, we have a federal law and we have a legislation. It is now in the stage of the development. Um, we our uh, the basis yet yeah, the basic federal law on experimental legal regimes for digital innovations in Russia uh, was approved in 2020. So the legislation for regulatory sandboxes in Russia are really really young, but I think it is already has a big has a is already very very promising. So. 
and you can see that uh, there are some projects which are already which already testing within the regulatory sandbox in Russia. So one service is for remote conclusion of a contract for the provision of mobile service. Uh, why do we test in it in Russia? Because nowadays, regarding to the Russian legislation, it is impossible to conclude the contract remotely. Uh, if we, of course, if we're talking about the, uh, the contract and provision of the mobile services. So regarding to Russian legislation, uh, the person must be, yes, in the place where these contracts are concluded. And uh, uh, within this project, uh, we, we want to observe if it is possible, if there will be no harm for consumers, for counterparties, if uh, we will make it. Another one, it's a drone cargo transportation. This example will be considered later on the slides. And uh, another one is the provision of the medical care via telemedicine. This is, uh, I think, one of the most controversial uh, examples of the project uh, under the regulatory sandboxes because although specialists said that uh, telemedicine is a very prospective field, but at the same time, of course, uh, there is a question if we really can use, uh, for example, um, if you use, we can use the medical observation remotely. Yes, because the telemedicine is all about it. And uh, for example, one of uh, my friends, he's a step up. Uh, once uh, uh, he, uh, he was asked to cure the eagle, uh, to cure the eagle distantly, remotely. So this is the example of how uh, the telemedicine could be used. So he tried to do his best to cure the eagle, <laughs> but of course it is not funny, but the eagle died after this. So, but nevertheless, this is the project with, which will be tested within the Russian regulatory sandbox, within the Russian regulatory sandbox. And um, the company who will do this, they want to check if it is possible to make a remote observation of the remote medical observation of, for example, the bus drivers before they will start the route. And now I want to discuss and to talk to you about the pros and contras of the regulatory sandboxes, not only in Russia, of course, but across the world. Uh, yes, and all my presentation, of course, devoted to the fact that they, they are really, really useful and these tools has a significant potential. But at the same time, yes, it has some, they have, they, they, it has some contrast. But first of all, uh, let's start with the, so of course, uh, the regulatory sandbox help to enable companies to experiment or to test their innovation in a safe environment, which minimizes the uh, regulatory risks of infraction, of course. Another one uh, pro for regulatory sandbox is that the regulators learn how new technology works in a low risk environment. And it helps to decide if we need to develop, as I told you earlier, yes, if it needs to be developed or not. But of course, if there are some pros, yes, there are, a lot, there are also a contra. So let's talk about contra. As uh, you can see in the slide, yes, there are some contras, of course. And first of all, about the regulatory sandboxes, it is experimental regulation and it is connected with the relaxation or with the refuse of uh, using some regulatory requirements. 
And of course, if we are talking about uh, such relaxation or such uh, refusal, it could lead to the violation of the human rights. And uh, on the next slide, we will see how could uh, regulatory sandboxes sometimes breach the right. And another one, um, contra for uh, contra of the using of the regulatory sandbox is um, the fact that it is said yes by some researchers uh, by some experts that the concept of the regulatory sandbox has become a covered effort to bypass the consumers protection law so how could that be explained of course, as I told you, if we want to test a uh, digital service, uh, we must, in a real environment, in a real market, we need whom? Of course, we need consumers. And if we're talking about this, the general requirement uh, to the regulatory sandbox, so it means that uh, the, the we must know the participant of the regulatory sandbox, of course, must notice the potential consumer about the fact that this product or service is under the experimental regulation. This is a basic requirements and uh, the regulation, the law on regulatory sandboxes across the world do have such provision because of course it is basic. The consumer must be warned, must be noticed. In uh, some jurisdictions, the notice is not enough. It is not enough to notice the consumer. Uh, there must be also the prior consent, which is of course, yes, very important. Why? Because uh, it is the right of consumer, the, the, the basic right of the consumer is the right of the information. And in this case, uh, he must be informed and he, and it's up to him to decide, yes, to give her his consent on you on being a part of the regulatory sandbox or not. But in some countries, uh, the legislation is even more progressive and I like it because, for example, if you're talking about the reg regulatory sandbox in Australia, uh, this uh, legislation has the provision which requires adequate compensation arrangement. For example, it is a minimum $1 million to cover if um, the harm was uh, uh, inflicted to the consumer within the experimental legal regime. So now I want to discuss a few cases with you. It is the Russian cases. The first one is about the regulatory sandbox, which, is, uh, which was launched for testing the artificial intelligence in Russia. And of course, nowadays, this is a big uh, discussion between, the, you, between this uh, regulation, the, between this regulatory sandbox, sorry, and the personal data protection. So, we have a federal law, we have another federal law, not the federal law for legal regime for digital innovation in Russia Federation. Uh, we have, there is another law. And uh, yes, it is a very, it has a very, very long title. It is a federal law on conducting an experiment to establish a special regulation to create the necessary conditions for the development and implementation of artificial intelligence technologies in the subject of the Russian Federation, the city of federal significance, Moscow, and amending of the federal law on personal data protection. Uh, this federal law was approved in April 2020, and uh, which is very curious, this first one, first one, this law was approved, and then the general law was, uh, the general law on experimental legal regimes in Russia, was approved in August 2020, which of course shows that um, 
sometimes yes our uh legisl the russian legislator is not is inconsistent sometimes but it of course it is connected with the fact that there were a lot of problems in approving uh, all the basic federal law on regulatory sandboxes in russia so the moscow city the the government of the moscow city said that we will have no time to wait for this federal law and that is why the federal law on testing artificial intelligence within the moscow city was approved uh, several months earlier. And of course, on the one hand, it is a very significant project. This experimental regime, this regulatory sandbox, has a very promising potential. Why? Uh, they started to, to test the possibility of using artificial intelligence-based services with what's so-called computer vision for radiation diagnostics, which is of course very, very important to the development of the medicine and of the healthcare in Russia. We actually have a lot of uh, significant projects uh, which connected with the medicine and the artificial intelligence. Uh, one of these projects is the Botkin Artificial Intelligence Project. It aimed at giving the artificial intelligence the opportunity to analyze the data of the patient of the patient and this technology already helped to um, to under to understand if the person has a cancer or not so sorry and at the same, yes, as I said, it is a very, it is a very, very potential. Yes, it is a very, it has a significant potential. But at the same time, there are some disadvantages of this legal regime, uh, or this experimental regime, which is made in Moscow. So, of course, it is about personal data. So, if the artificial intelligence, yes, if you if you use the artificial intelligence to yes to look through the uh cards of the patients yes of course it is about the personal data and if we will use real personal data the personal data of each citizen of moscow it will be very very expensive and it will be it, it is one of the barriers of course to the, the development of the artificial intelligence the cost yes the um it's how much money should we pay yes to for example to use this personal data and that is why uh this federal law requires some amendments to the personal data protection law of russian federation and it is said that all personal data of the residents of moscow will be transferred to the governmental body and then to the participants of regulatory sandbox without the consent of the residents of Moscow. Of course, uh, I am talking, uh, it is not the personal, real personal data of the citizens of the residents of Moscow. Yes, in this case, it will be very, very rude, um, rude violation of right for, for the right to have some privacy. Now, there is a, a, another requirement another condition of the transfer of this data and this is about the fact that the data can be used without the consent of the residents of the moscow only if these data are depersonalized of course if these data are depersonalized yes it is much cheaper but at the same time uh this process yes this term depersonalization is a very very new for russia it is, um, and there are not so many research and there are no proper regulation to this process so how would be how can we say that uh, how which data could be, are depersonalized yes and how can we regulate this who will depersonalize the data so 
regarding to Russian legislation, yes, we do not have answers still on this question. And we, which is uh, uh, also that we do not have a legal approved mechanism for the depersonalization. We do not have a standard. Uh, we do not have a developed technical legal regulation for this, uh, for the depersonalization of the personal data. For example, yes, just to compare, in United States, of course, because they are in the first place of the digital competitiveness ranking, ranking uh, their legislation on digital technologies are much more developed than Russian. So they are on the first place regarding to this ranking. And Russia is on the, in the place of Russia in this ranking is the 63. If we're talking about Brazil, it is, no, it's Russia, it's 55. Yes, Brazil, it is, it is 63. So we are, we are not among the leaders of the developing of competitive uh, digital technologies, regretfully. And for example, yes, in the United States, uh, there is a system of the developed standards in the sphere of digital technologies and the standard, there is even a standard uh, which describes the way to protect the confidentiality of the personal information. And in this uh, standard, the procedure of the depersonalization of the personal data is described. But as I said, they have no such standards in Russia. Although I must say that our legal technical regulation are, is developing. And of course we will have such standards, but a little bit later. And this is a very big problem now because we do not know how to use, yes, how to use depersonalized data in a legitimate way. And this leads to the violation of the right of this resident of Moscow to a privacy. Although the whole idea of this project, yes, of this computer vision project is a very, very perspective. Another case I want to discuss with you today is the regulatory sandbox for drones or unmanned aerial vehicles for cargo transportation. This is, of course, when talking about drones, we just, the, the, the first one which comes to our mind is the safety. Yes, safety is a very important. So, uh, we have a regulation, of course, of the cargo transportation. Uh, we have some regulations of the flight of unmanned aerial vehicles. So it is, will be easier if I will call them drone. So in Air Code of Russia, uh, the flights of drones, of unmanned aerial vehicles, they are allowed. But there are some requirements for this flight. So, yes, as I said, it is, yes, the unmanned vehicles are free to fly, of course, in a special zone. But they if these unmanned aerial vehicles, so there must be somewhere external pilot who operates this unmanned aerial vehicle. And uh, this pilot must be certificated. Of course, he must have a certif certificate which proves uh, his skills in this. And uh, this person might have some special education and two years of the preparatory experience. In case of the testing drones for cargo transportation, of course, uh, it is maybe, not, not maybe, yes, but there, these requirements could be some um, extra, some excessive. And that is why uh, regarding the federal law on experimental legal regime in the sphere of the digital innovations in Russia Federation, uh, it is allowed to apply the next relaxation within the program of the experimental legal regime. So it could be no inter external pilot while we testing the unmanned aerial vehicles. What does it mean? It means that uh, the artificial intelligence could operate the unmanned aerial vehicles. Or artificial intelligence could operate 
and uh, if they if the eternal pilot still need it, yes, if it is not an artificial intelligence, if it is a person, so uh, the above mentioned requirements about the education, about the certification, they are not applicable during the testing time. And in this case, of course, so this is good. Uh, uh, this is good. Why? It gives us more opportunities to develop this innovation, to develop drones. And it is said that uh, by 2035, the drones will be very, very widespread across the world. Uh, because, for example, now in Russia, we use drones for personal purposes, for example, you know, just if we want the drone just to fly around and we make some video, some beautiful video. It is a very, um, the favorite tradition of our Russian, uh, Russian true tourist drones. And at the same time, of course, uh, the, in, in some other countries, the drones are already used for commercial purposes. For example, yes, for cargo transportation. But it was impossible in Russia until the federal law and experimental legal regimes was approved. And for example, I don't know if you are familiar with Yandex, Yandex Corporation, the famous corporation in uh, Russia, and this is a competitor to a Google Corporation. Uh, the Yandex Corporation made a decision to test uh, the unmanned aerial vehicles for cargo transportation. And they wanted, they said that we want to make, to make this test in Russia. But in this time, in the time when they made it, they were when Yandex to test, yes, to test these cargo transport drones for cargo transportation, uh, we didn't have the regulatory sandbox for this testing. So Yandex made a decision to test their drones in Arizona. And uh, this test is still ongoing. And because uh, they do have um, regulatory Arizona. So the testing is a very successful, but of course the representative of the Yandex Corporation, they said that uh, when of the regulatory sandbox in Russia start, finally start working, we will first move from Arizona to Russia to test these unmanned aerial vehicles, which is operated by the artificial intelligence. But of course, and in this case, yes, the, the, the safety is the, the one which matters. Why? So, if uh, who will be responsible? Yes, as we, when we talk about the uh, Sophia the robot, and there was after the, there was an example of the drones. Yes, who will be responsible if this if the artificial intelligence will be up, will operate uh, the drone if, if, for example, there will be some crash? So this is uh, the problem of uh, the regulatory sandbox. And if it, yes, I'm, I'm now will uh, sum it up. So at the present time, yes, there is a very famous quotation of the Rothschild, his assertion, who owns the information, he owns the world, the world. Yes, but uh, it could be paraphrased, yes, in state of the art quotation, which is, uh, which sounds like that. The one who owns digital technology owns the world. And it is really true nowadays. At the same time, uh, yes, that technologies are our future. Yes, but the technologies are not centric. And we must remember, so the human beings are still, this, this, the human are still centric. And we must remember it. And this is very important. Well, and for example, if we will talk about the Russian legislation, the legislation on artificial intelligence, uh, the all, if we will look through this legislation, it, it seems like the, the main purpose of this legislation 
is just develop artificial intelligence and gain some money. So there is no uh, principles, yes, the principles, uh, ethical guidelines for uh, creation of the trustworthy artificial intelligence in Russia. It, no, but now, yes, now some new legal documents appeared and these principles are already implemented, but is, it is only now. In comparison, for example, with the legislation of the European Union on artificial intelligence, you know, I like this legislation so much because uh, the, a, the European Union aimed at creation of trustworthy artificial intelligence. And this is very important. And they have a lot of ethical guidelines to create this trustworthy artificial intelligence for the European society. Regretfully, we do not have such concept in Russia, but Maybe, maybe later we will have such. And in this case, of course, the policy should be balanced and the interest of innovators and companies and the whole society and the state, of course, should be considered. And in this case, the correct usage of the, uh, the regulatory sandbox allows us to understand if this innovation deserves the, to be widespread or not, if this innovation deserves regulation and will it benefit to the sustainable development goals or not? And I know that all of you are familiar with this uh, very, very famous man. Yes, it's Elon Musk. And I like his quotation very much. He said that uh, once in an interview, he said that with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. In all the stories, there, there is a guy with a pentagram and the holy water. We think that it will work, but of course, he, can, he can't control the demon. It never works. In this case, of course, um, the, we must, yes, we must test the innovation before Uh, here we have the old school Terminator movie. Uh, always Hi, Elisabetta, are you back? I get your mics off. Oh, I just... Your mic's off, your microphone is off. Yes, now it is on. So... Oh, yeah, you're back. You're back. Yes, maybe because I'm in Russia and we have some difficulties with the connection. So I'm so sorry for this. So yes, no and I will now, I will not switch on my presentation because <laughs> I'm a little bit scared that it may influence again the quality of my connection. Yes, and it was a picture from the Terminator movie and uh, I used this picture and I used this example of the Terminator always when me and my students are discussing the future of law and digital technologies. And my students said, let's regulate and we will see what will be further, but let's do something. We must, we must uh, develop the digital technologies. For example, we must grant the legal status for the um, robots with the artificial intelligence. I'll just say them, wait, remember the Terminator movie. This is the good example of how incorrect policy could influence our future. And that is why, again, we should use regulatory sandboxes to have the ability to see the potential, not only the potential,
I couldn't listen the end of it. I think your connection is a little bit unstable. Can you speak now? So I unmute and yeah, you are muted now. I will unmute you. Try to unmute yourself, please. Go ahead, speak. Let me see if I can listen to you. Say something, go ahead. Elisaveta, can you hear me now? Uh, hello? Nope. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me, Elisaveta? Just nod if you can hear me. Yeah, I think I think her connection went down, so uh, uh, thanks Professor a lot. Daniel, just okay, uh, go ahead, Francisco. It's she mentioned here in the chat that her sound doesn't work now. Yeah, I don't know if some some problem happened, but yeah. Yeah, I think. Well, at least uh, well, at least she covered all the topics. Uh, we're not going to be able to to make any any questions here, but. Uh, I think most of our attendees are Brazilians, right? At least by the names, they look yeah. Brazilian. So maybe if I can explain a little bit in Portuguese what she said. Uh, Elisabetta, can you hear us? I don't think she can even hear us because she's not nodding her head. Elisabetta, can you hear us? Oh, she's speaking me with me through WhatsApp. Let me see. Oh, she, no, uh, she, she, fell. she fell, yeah. É, bom, é, o que ela falou aqui, e que é um, o Brasil, ele acabou de estabelecer a CVM, é, na verdade, estabeleceu a instrução 626 de maio de 2020, então é recente, para empresas de nova tecnologia. Então, estabeleceu aqui um, um o Banco Central, obviamente, vai coordenar essas atividades, mas estabeleceu um regulamento para o regulatório sandbox, o sandbox regulatório. Mas o que me pareceu na palestra dela, que ela cobriu muitos países, é que, de fato, internacionalmente, a gente tem um grande sandbox testando o próprio sandbox. Né? A gente tem uma, uma, uma caixa de areia internacional onde um modelo adequado, correto a ser seguido, ainda não foi plenamente estabelecido. Então, o próprio sandbox é uma inovação para esse tipo de teste. Né? Então, ela falou de casos práticos que é bem relevante. A gente no Brasil iniciou agora. É, a gente tem que pegar exemplos como o do UK, da Grã-Bretanha de 2014, que foi o primeiro, e ver como isso tem funcionado. Então, nessa área, e como a AMBRA está desenvolvendo muitos estudos de direito comparado, é, a gente tem que realmente fazer um estudo de direito comparado, ver a experiência brasileira, a experiência estrangeira, russa ou de qualquer outro país, principalmente nos BRICS. Né? Eu sempre... É, os BRICS estão crescendo muito, então sempre comparar com os BRICS, a gente viu que a Índia também tem regulação, a China é, não estava ali no mapa, mas deve ter alguma coisa em relação a... Talvez não por causa do tipo de governo né, que, que, que é estabelecido, mas, mas é, é um estudo realmente relevante a ser seguido, e a palestra dela foi, foi brilhante nesse sentido de estabelecer esse estudo comparado. Infelizmente ela caiu, a internet dela... I think ah, ela back. voltou. She's back. Elisaveta, can you hear us loud and clear? Houston, Houston, can you hear us? Ela está com algum problema na conexão. É. É. Mas, e, e, professor Daniel, eu queria agradecer a escolha da Elisaveta, né? agradecer a o convite, a, a participação dela foi realmente muito, muito interessante a, a, a apresentação dela e especialmente que é uma, uma cidade muito querida para mim, né? a cidade da minha esposa, coincidentemente ela... que sorte, que sorte a Elisabetta né? da cidade que da minha sorte. esposa já fui duas vezes lá nessa cidade no meio da Rússia e... mas é isso eu não sei se ela Elisaveta, I don't know if you can hear us. É, ela falou que não. Ela acabou de não. falar no WhatsApp aqui para mim que não. Ah, não tá ok. Conseguindo. Realmente deu algum problema na internet dela lá. É. Ok. É, é. Bom. Mas é isso. Eu depois vou entrar em contato com ela. Eu não sei, professor Daniel, você fica à vontade para encerrar, tá bom? Ok. E eu agradeço. Eu já, eu já enviei para o Alfredo o contato dela. Se você quiser pegar meu telefone também, Francisco. Tá. Ela usa o WhatsApp, tá? 
Então pode mandar, eu posso mandar o um e-mail também dela, não tem problema nenhum. Não, tá perfeito. Bom? Ela é super tá receptiva. Bom. Como Obrigado. você percebeu. Oh, she's ah, back. there she is back. Do you hear can us? You hear us? Say yes. Nod your head if you can hear us. Or not? No, she oh, can't no, hear. She, can't. she just no, chat. Okay. 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 So uh, if you, anyone, anyone has any questions, just put on the chat and maybe she can write. Mm -hmm. No worries. Se alguém tiver alguma pergunta, coloca no, no chat que ela, que ela responde. Se quiser fazer em português, eu consigo traduzir também. Não tem problema nenhum. Não precisa ser em inglês. Alguém? Não, até agora não, não vi nenhuma pergunta aqui para ela. Okay, então, let's wrap it up. Vamos... Let's, yeah, let's do <risos> it. Encerrar, ok. Porque, deu. Obrigado, Francisco. Um prazer. Obrigado, professor Daniel. Um abraço, hein? Um abração. Demos Tchau. sorte que foi no final, né? Demos sorte que a internet caiu no final, então deu Deu sorte que foi bem no final. Foi no último, é. no último slide, basicamente. Não, acabou. Né? Tinha acabado já. Já estava é. dando thank you. Então, beleza. Um abraço. Um grande abraço. Um abraço. Tchau. Tchau.